Through Daily Prayer, Lecture 3, Part 2. Lord Jesus, in the infirmity of my flesh, I resist the devil and submit myself to you. James 4, 7. And request a fullness of the Spirit. Ephesians 5, 18. I wish to tarry until I receive this fullness. Luke 24, 49. I do not wish to be one at ease in Zion. Amos 6, 1. Quotation. May Christians play cards? Question mark. You never knew a card-playing professor who had power with God in prayer. All cards come in power goes out, said Hans Christian Andersen, quote, When the evil one saw a Bible for the first time, he wanted to put a bad book against it and invented card-playing in the next book. Continuing, a few pieces of gay pasteboard passed hither and thither in a group of young people as an innocent amusement, and there are those who contend that poker and progressive euchre and seven-up, if played in a parlor, are not inconsistent with the Christian profession. Let us read the strong, sarcastic words of the late Sam Jones, on the subject as reported in Chautauqua Herald, I am often asked, do you think it any harm to play cards? Are you a Methodist? Yes. And you want to play cards? Yes. Go on, play day and night, because it is going to be too warm for that unless you have some asbestos cards for those ordinary linen cards from these ordinary linen cards won't stand the fire down there. What do I mean by this sort of talk? Simply this, that wherever the love of sin of any description possesses the soul, there is no salvation for that soul in that condition. What do I mean? I mean this that there is no theological book in Protestantism that describes salvation to be anything else than deliverance from the guilt and from the love and from the divine dominion of sin. Playing cards is the amusement of intellectual and spiritual starvelings. A woman in Chicago said to me, what will I do with my husband? He is active practice and he come home tired and I sat down to play cards with him as a recreation. I said, take the little idiot to the asylum and amuse him there. You can't find a well-funded asylum in any of the states of America that has not a deck of cards in every room. What for? To amuse the idiots. But all the idiots aren't in the insane asylum by any means. God pity a woman bold enough to marry such a man and call him husband. God pity you if you have to grovel like that for recreation. You are getting down pretty low. In playing progressive euchre, it is getting to be a fashionable game. Whenever you see a church in camp, they are death on cards. That is, they play cards all around. Did you ever see how Soldiers are playing cards all the time. You couldn't go over a single battlefield, but they were scattered all over it. When a fellow goes into a fight, he throws his cards away. It is a fact. You men who fought in the last war well know that every battlefield was covered with cards. And I will tell you another thing. Whenever God Almighty's church moves out of church and goes off to battle, she will throw away cards too. I'm often asked, do you think it is wrong? Do you ever hear anybody ask, do you think it is wrong to pray? To pray in the family? To read the Bible? Did you ever hear anyone ask that question? No. 
Why? Because they know it ain't. But these people who are running around to know if there is any harm in this thing, they are hemmed, headed that way themselves. I have never seen the day since God forgave me my sins and took me up in his loving arms that I have had any more desire to go to the ballroom or to the card table than a desire to go to the pub. That is the true as I am standing here, Marilyn the Christian Advocate. The card table is an institute of God or the devil, which no sincere person will contend for a moment that it is of God, but its fruits it is known. In 1890, 125 persons in the United States were shot or stabbed over gambling times. 25 were stabbed and 55 were shot over the gambling tables, or as a direct result thereof. Besides these, six attempted suicide and 60 persons were murdered in cold blood, while two were driven insane. A large proportion of the gamblers in our land had their first lesson in professedly Christian homes. Can a righteous God give his approval of and his blessing on a practice whose fruits are such as abundant harvest of crime, bloodshed, suffering, and death. He must do one or the other, which may a Christian approve and practice what Christ cannot approve? Where is there an entirely consecrated Christian who would defend the card table? Echo ask where? Dying sinners rarely, if ever, seek consolation from card-playing church members. Where is the home in which are both the card table and the family altar? Again, Echo asks, where? Shame on a professed Christian who will zealously defend the card table, which has never in a single instance elevated its votaries one hair's breadth on the scale of morals made one heart purer or one life holier. See law, meditate on that. Next is the act of dancing. When you enter the dance hall, the power of God will stay outside. Count the time spent in dance as opposed to the ministry of the saints or sinners. What is your motive for being there in the first place? Most accomplished dancers in the world are untutored savages who practice in a state of nudity around their campfires. Many a sinner will excuse themselves because they have found a Sunday go that was at their same dance parlor the Saturday night before. Lord, let me dance the dance of David. Next, it is the movies, either in the theater or on the TV, or other electronic device. Too often there is unhindered language and multiple violations of the Ten Commandments. Such regular exposure changes the senses and dulls the holy response to the immorality. Add to this the time wasted opposed to the word or being a witness. From cards to dancing to movies, we moved to tobacco products. My father-in-law was a smoker. He continued to smoke after being saved. He once drove back to his hometown to specifically witness to an old friend. As he was witnessing to his friend, he had a pack of cigarettes in his shirt pocket. The man pointed to the pack in his pocket and said, It seems to me that a man claiming to be converted to Christ, it would make a change in his behavior. In many a church parking lot can be found many a cigarette butt. Lord, deliver us from all evil. Romans 14, 23. 
Lord, a more sinister evil is our evil speaking. We were often guilty of backbiting, Psalm 15, 3, or spreading tales, Leviticus 19, 16, and Proverbs 11, 13. Lord Jesus, please set us free from such evil speaking. Psalm 34, 12 to 14, and Ephesians 4, 31. Lord, I am guilty of a great failure in family worship. Lord, I cannot demand anything from my adult children, for they have minds and hearts of their own. The only thing I can do now is have my own personal devotion and hope they see the example. Maybe if I am a better witness in behavior, they will be convinced of Christ. I know that there are many unkind hurts and feelings about Christian faith among my children. Lord, help me to do my best not to have a part in negative influence. Let me demonstrate, demonstrate brotherly love, Leviticus 19, 17, and 18, without grudging, James 5, 9. Help me, my Lord, to live in the light of your love, 1 John 2, 9 to 11, and 4, 20 and 21. For past offenses, I implore your forgiveness, Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Please assist my forgiveness of my fellow man, Colossians 3, 13. Let me show mercy and love of God, Matthew 5, 7 and 1 John 4, 7. You have commanded us to love, John 15, 17. And to know this is to obey, 1 John 2, 4, and to walk the talk, 1 John 2, 6. And the next question of interest and its ignorance is answered. Prevailing Prayer, Lecture 2, Part 3. A question of interest and its ingenious answer. This is a quotation. A very interesting question was asked the editor of the Christian Advocate, which has an important bearing on the subject of this lecture, which, with the pertinent answer given are as follows. Question. A brother had for 20 years been a Christian as he firmly believed. He observed the means of grace. He relates several remarkable answers to his prayers occurring during that time that bear a good evidence to the answers of those related by others. Those who knew him believed him to be a Christian man. But one day he was converted and now emphatically affirmed that he had never been a Christian prior to that time but was deceived and would have lost his soul. What relation did he sustain in Christ? Is it consistent with the Christian truth to believe that God will answer the prayers of others than a righteous man? Was he deceived? Those answers being granted in favor of the faithful and fervent prayer of others? Question. Answer. This is a deep question. As helpful as its elucidation, we submit five points. One, if there is no reason to believe that this brother was a hypocrite, he is probably deceived now as to his former religious experience. Anything far more common than many suppose. It is possible for a man to be a Christian and subsequently to come confused in his views and think he was not. 
though not so common as for men to think they are Christians when they are not? Answer 2. If he had not clear evidence of conversion, but was consciously living up to the life he had during those 20 years, he had the faith of a servant, as Mr. Wesley puts it, though not that of a son. Answer 3. He may have been a Christian for a considerable, considerable period of time and had a brief interval of backsliding before he came to his present light and now recognizing his backsliding properly he may have repudiated his first experience unjustly. Answer 4. He may have received a very great blessing so great that having nothing but the memory of his former experience to compare with it, his present state may seem so far above his recollection of that that he thinks he never was converted. Answer 5. God does answer the prayers of the wicked reverently made in extreme circumstances and connected with the promise of obeying him. It is one of the means of leading them to Christ. Nevertheless, the supposed answers to prayers that men attest, running through a long period of wicked lives, are quite as long to be coincidences as real answers. For the scriptures distinctly state that a habit of deliberate wickedness is incompatible with any influence at the throne of grace. But as a man may think he is sick when he is well, or well when he is sick, may recover from an actual sickness and have a mistaken notion as to what really cured him. Or maybe made sick and not know what made him so sick, and attribute it to something harmless or even beneficial. In like manner, positive statements about religious experience may or may not be in harmony with the facts. Perhaps if we knew this man, we should have no confidence in any of his statements, and that without impeaching his general honesty, or we might believe he had been a better Christian prior to the time that he says he was converted, after the lapse of 20 years than he has been since. Or we might agree fully with all of his statements. Nothing can take the place of protracted experience of the individual case in judging human character and conduct, whether religiously or otherwise. End of that quote. poem, perfect cleansing. Who would be cleansed from every sin? Must to God's holy altar bring. The whole of life is joy, is tears, is hope, is love, is power, is fears, the will and every cherished thing. Must make this sweeping sacrifice, choose God and dare reproach and shame and boldly stand in storm or flame for him who paid redemption's price, then trust, not struggle, to believe, and trusting wait for doubt, but pray, that in his own good time he'll say, Thy faith has saved this, now receive. His time is when the soul brings all, is all upon his altar lain, when pride and self-conceit are slain. Crucified with Christ we fall, helpless upon his word we lie. When faithful to his word we feel, the cleansing touch, the Spirit's seal, and know that he does sanctify by A.T. Alice.
power of the name of Christ, lecture four. Lord, your direction in our praying is that we are to ask the Father in your name, John sixteen twenty three. For no man may approach the Father without you, John six forty four. The Father is in the business of supplying, Philippians four thirteen. While our sin may close the door to your seven eleven storehouse, the name of Jesus will open its doors. Jesus, your name gives us the access, Romans five two and Ephesians two eighteen. Therefore. We can come boldly with confidence, Ephesians 3.12. What privilege we have to access the portals of glory at the mention of thy name. Yea, what authority, when I invoke the name of Jesus, I surrendered all my personal identity in body and spirit and join the Holy Spirit in prevailing prayer. When I address the King of Kings, I acknowledge his kingdom and authority for the things I believe, Matthew 21, 22. When I have made such a request, I can expect that it will be granted, John 14, 13. Again, by asking the Father in Jesus' name, it will be done, John 15, 16. When I am praying in the Spirit, I can conjoin with the Holy Spirit, and the will of the Lord will be manifest. Quotation. The prevailing, the correction, the privilege of Christ's power of attorney. Many years ago in the city of New York, a merchant failed to a very large amount. After surrendering all his goods to the creditors, he found himself hopelessly bankrupt. No one would give him credit to the amount of a single dollar. He had a brother living in the city of Boston, who was everywhere known to be worth millions of dollars. This wealthy brother sent Onto his bankrupt brother a power of attorney, no limits being designated to conduct business in his name. The poor bankrupt immediately hired a building in the business center of the city, filled it with goods, and commenced operations as one of the most prosperous merchants in the city of New York. In speaking to a friend upon the subject, he said, I will tell you how much I am worth. In reality, in this city, I am practically just as rich as my brother is. I can purchase anything and live just as well as he can. Yet if I should presume to ask anything in my own name, no man would credit me to the amount of a single dollar. I once in a while for my own amusement, thus to illustrate my position. I enter the store of an importer, and having selected a quantity of goods, request him to send them to my store. But to whom shall I charge them? He replies. To myself, of course, I respond. I cannot do that, is his prompt reminder. If your creditor should become aware that you have goods in this state in your store, they would seize them at once and I should lose them forever. I show him my power of attorney and remark that I will purchase the goods in my brother's name. Take what you want is the prompt reply. In that dear name I could purchase anything the man had. So when and where Christ expressly and specifically authorizes us to ask in his name, he puts us in full possession of a power of eternity by which we may obtain at a throne of grace all that he would 
were he in our circumstance of need, and should he of his own name and behalf ask for the same identical blessings. God cannot deny himself, nor can he deny his son in his own name on be or behalf. Equally, it is impossible for the Eternal Father to withhold any good thing of which the Son has said, Ask in my name of the Father. That specific blessing the Father can no more dishonor the name of Christ, his only begotten Son, when and where he has expressed the authorized the use of his name, that he could cast dishonor upon Christ himself, were he personally asking for the same blessing. However, there are expressed conditions on which Christ has authorized us to ask in his name. We must renounce all sin and abide in him and his word in us. We must walk in faith, nothing wavering. Oh, how much there is in those last two words, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. But let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. That's where we will pause for this round. This is Prevailing Prayer, Lecture 4, Part 2, as we continue in our study and prayer. Lord Jesus, I must appreciate all your merit in my salvation. My eternal destiny is absolutely totally dependent upon your sacrifice and grace. The significance of your name is totally manifest in John 3, 16. Quote, I am too perverse to be otherwise than reprobated. From Cowper. Lord, we glorify that in the hymn there is a fountain filled with blood. When I am joined with the Holy Spirit, that name will be glorified. John 16, 13, and 14. This is the Spirit of Truth from the Father. John 15, 26. The open face of Christ is manifest when I took into your when I look into your mirror. 2 Corinthians 3:18. It is with Christ in the Holy Spirit that my prevailing prayer must be made. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. Lord, your name is the epitome of my prevailing prayer. My language may fail to communicate my heart, but the name of Jesus is sufficient. After your resurrection, you said to Mary, Mary. She replied, Rabboni. This is the simplicity of our exchange of prayer. All powerful redemptive love is everything. I can only reign in this life by the name. Romans 5, 17. When I forsake my sin, you will have mercy. Isaiah 55, 7. When I ask the Father in your name, John 15, 16. Lord, for my witness, I need the power. Acts 1, 8. Lord, I sing the hymn, take the precious name of with you. Jesus, it is from you that the water of life will flow through me to others. I want to abide in you that I may know that what I ask will be granted. John 15, 7. I desire to be a joint heir with you in the work of the ministry. Romans 8, 17. I want to be able to find your unsearchable riches, Ephesians 3, 8. You, Lord, paid it all, so all to you I owe. In your name I can have the boldness to enter in, Hebrews 10, 19. 
For I have the gift of God, Romans 5, 8. As I am in you, Lord, I have access to all your fullness, Colossians 2, 8. Poem, Christ's Signature Honor. Christ has won every attribute of the Godhead in the interest of the obedient and trusting soul. And the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the true Asheris, seated on his royal banqueting throne, reaches out the golden scepter of his promise, asking, What is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee, and what is thy request? Christ has dep deposited in the bank of heaven unlimited treasure of pardon, love, peace, joys, etc., in the interest of a lost race. Every promise of God's word is a draft on this bank. Good for the face of it because it has the signature of Christ with his own all-atoning blood. I speak it reverently and thoughtfully. If you abide in Christ, we have just as good a right and are just as welcome to come to the Father and ask for all the fullness of God as Christ himself. The Power of Jesus' Name Oh, the power of Christ's name. The following beautiful incident illustrates the fact. William Reynolds of Peoria, Illinois, the earnest and successful Sunday school worker, tells the following story which he heard from the lips of the missionary himself. Quote, the Reverend E.P. Scott, while laboring as a missionary in India, saw on the street one of the strangest looking heathen his eyes had ever lit upon. On inquiry, he found that he was a representative of one of the inland tribes that lived way up in the mountain districts and which came down once a year to trade. Upon further investigation, he found that the gospel had never been preached to them and that it was very hazardous thus to venture among them because of their murderous propensities. He was stirred with earnest desires to break upon them the bread of life. He went to his lodging place, fell on his knees, and pleaded for divine direction. Arising from his knees, he packed his valet and took his violin with which he was accompanied to sing, and his pilgrim staff and he started in the direction of the Macedonian cry. As he bade his fellow missionaries farewell, they said, We shall never see you again. It is madness for you to go. But he said, I must preach Jesus to them. For two days he traveled without scarcely meeting a human being, until at last he found himself in the mountains and suddenly surrounded by a crowd of savages. Every spear was instantly pointed at his heart. He expected that every minute would be his last. Not knowing any other resource, he tried the power of singing the name of Jesus to them. Drawing forth his violin, he began with closed eyes to sing and pray, All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Being afraid to open his eyes, he sang on till the third verse. And whilst the singing the stanzas, let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball, to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. He opened his eyes to see what they were going to do when lo, the spears had dropped from their hands and the big tears were falling from their eyes. They afterward invited him to their homes. He spent two and a half years among them. His labors were so richly rewarded 
that he, when he was compelled to leave them because of impaired health and return to this country, they followed him for 30 miles. An old missionary, they said, come back to us again. There are tribes beyond that never heard the gospel. He could not resist the entreaties. After visiting America, he went back again to continue his labors till he sank into the grave among them. No devil has so powerful a hold on the human soul, but the power of Christ's name is answer to prayer. And cast him out. How wonderful the privilege of using the power of Christ's name in lifting the race Godward. End of quote. Who then has the right to approach the throne of mercy and grace? Me, if I have been cleansed from sin and been living in obedience, when I'm fully concentrated and my all is on the altar, when I'd rather die than compromise with the world, for such an exalted name is the name of Jesus above all other, Philippians 2.11. He is my great high priest without sin, Hebrews 4.14. And he allows me to come boldly. Verse 16. Poem. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears. Tis life and health and peace. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Will you? Lecture 5 is next. An all-inclusive condition of faith. Faith is intimately associated and interchangeable with prayer. Prayer is the asking, and faith is receiving the answer. The woman breaking the alabaster box on Jesus was an act of faith. Luke seven thirty-seven to thirty-nine. The prayer of faith is putting God to fulfill his word. Lord, what is faith? Have you made it a mystery? 1 Timothy 3, 9. Whatever, it must be accompanied with a pure conscience. But my Lord, I approach with much difficulty and trepidation. It is the subject of the nature of prayer. There is much misunderstanding in the meaning and definition of terms of endearment. Lord, I need you to teach me the various terms of prayer from your word. Lord, on one occasion after you had prayed, the disciples asked you to teach them to pray. Luke 11, 1 to 13. This is what you said. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Following this suggested form of our praying, you gave us the illustration of a neighbor asking neighbor for bread in the middle of the night because friends had come and he had nothing to feed them. While the man initially declined, but due to the man's persistence, he gave him the bread he asked for. If us evil men of the flesh can give, then the Father will be more willing to give to those who ask in faith, believing. Lord, I must have a clear view of what faith means to you. 
such understanding will fashion my character and shape my destiny in the matter of prayer. It will embellish a greater heart attitude, Proverbs 23, 7. Jesus, I exercise a minimal amount of faith in the things of everyday life with family, friends, and material associations in business. A greater blessing will be received when I believe in that which I have not seen, John 20, 29. Faith is an essential part of bringing salvation to the soul of man and is a blessing to all other spiritual matters in Christian fellowship, Hebrews 11, 6. There is a basic of faith in our association with the world and even ourselves. Faith must be mingled but with reason and truth. There must be knowledge by personal testimony. Others can provide assurance that prevailing prayer will be answered. Above all else is the testimony of God himself, 1 John 5, 9. He does not lie or mislead. He is beyond making a mistake. Whatever, whatsoever, he will say will be the truth. The dynamic foundation for a correct Christian faith is the word of God. Lord Jesus, in what class would you fix my measure of faith? Am I sufficient in common faith of all men in my mind and testimony? Have I exercised sufficient faith for salvation? Have I surrendered a full measure of the will in my heart to you? Have I left out any options? Lord, I want to reach the place where my faith will be a complete outpouring of my soul with reliance on you for the will, the reason, and the truth. Lord, I wish to have my entire future apprehended in absolute faith to you. Lord, I stop here to gain an understanding of faith in its terms. There is a use of the term faith in reference to the gospel. In Acts 6, 7, disciples were added to the faith. In Romans 1, 2 to 5, it is the scriptures that are called the faith. After Paul's conversion, it is said that he preached the faith, Galatians 1.23. And Paul called it the mystery of the faith. The flip side of this term of faith is in the accepting of the gospel. The Greek term pistuo is used 256 times in the New Testament for the act of believing. And pistis is used 247 times with faith as an act of trust by the petitioner. Absolute faith, then, would be the surrender of the whole man in the fullest sense of the Redeemer for his use and glory. And we will stop there. Until next time. Continuing now with Prevailing Prayer, Lecture 4, Part 3. Faith as an act of trust is a personal act whereby I may exercise a natural gift under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Such faith moves into the invisible and eternal state of the Savior. Quote, I define saving faith thus. The penitent sinner, having ascended to the truthfulness of the testimony of God in the gospel, believes in his heart and with all his heart, affectionately, confidently, that God the Father, for Christ's sake, fulfilling his promise, does now freely and fully forgive all the sins he has ever committed. Paul says in Hebrews 11, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, because there is in it an element of assurance that the things hoped for exist and that we shall have them. 
it is to our inner consciousness the same as a check on the bank is to the senses. The check is the substance of the cash hoped for and the evidence of the cash yet unseen. Faith gives the things hoped for substance in the minds and hearts of believers just as though they had the most tangible proof of their existence and possession. Miss Sandbergel says, quote, every year, I might say almost every day, I believe I seem to see more clearly how all the rest and gladness and power of the Christian life hinges on one thing, and that is taking God at his word, believing that he really means exactly what he says, and accepting the very words in which he reveals his goodness and grace without substantiation. Others are alternating the precise moods or tenses which he has seen fit to use. Miss M Mr. Muller, then, whom perhaps no human being has more fully trusted Christ, says, quote, in the simplest manner in which I am able to express it, faith is the assurance that what God has said in his word is true. God will act according to what he has said in his word. This assurance, this reliance on God's word, this confidence is faith. Quote, in regard to the nature of his own faith, as some have said that his faith was a gift of faith, he says, my faith is just the same kind of faith that all God's children have had. My faith is their faith, though there may be more of it because my faith has been a little more developed by exercise than theirs. End of that quote. The core element in the act of faith is that it, in it, and which we step out and beyond the reach of our senses or perception, beyond apprehended facts, beyond facts apprehensible to, by the senses, intuitive or demonstration, to equally veritable facts, Cognizable, cognizable only by faith. As the telescope enables us to bring within our vision and investigation worlds almost infinitely beyond the reach of unaided sight, so faith is the instrument by which we bring within the compass of cognition the experience of most wonderfully blessed facts in the realm of the invisible and spiritual. Hey! It brings us face to face with the invisible and infinite one, and if possible, makes God more real, evident than ourselves. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God here and now. Quote, by the eye we being within the mind that which is far away, we can bring the sun and far off stars into the mind by a glance with the eye. So by trust and faith, we bring the Lord Jesus near to us, and though he may be far away in heaven, he enters into our hearts. Only look to Jesus, for the him is strictly true. There is the life in a look at the crucified one. There is life at this moment for thee. To unbelief, It is stepping out upon nothing but an intelligent and developed faith. It is treading on the foundations of the universe. Reverend S. A. Keen gives his illustration of the act of faith. Quote, a professor in a university on the Pacific coast had been for 10 years a seeker of full salvation one day, an aged minister called at his home. The conversation turned on Christian experience. The old man repeated what God had done for him. The professor said, Father, I have been seeking this blessing for ten years. I believe I have put all on the altar and that I live with all on the altar, but I haven't received the power of sanctifying grace to my soul. Said the old man, do you want to receive it now? 
The professor replied, yes. Well, said the professor, let us kneel down here, and you may receive it now. When on their knees, the minister asked, Professor, are you wholly given to God? The professor replied, I believe I am. You have put on the altar. Yes. Well, Professor, the Lord says the altar sanctifies the gift. Is it true or not? He dared not give God the lie and reply, it is true. And instantly he felt the blood washed him whiter than snow. How, my Lord, does faith work? Is it not simple, subjective, and all-inclusive? Is it not necessary in the propagation of all Christian activity? Is it not the belief in the work of Jesus, John 8, 29? All things done in righteousness are works of faith. Such faith will bring us into full harmony with God. The objective act brings to light that we are heirs with Christ, Romans 8, 17, and that everything can be had, 1 Corinthians 3, 21. Faith is the basic condition for salvation. Faith brings all things spiritual to the soul. We are thereby changed into the image of Christ by faith, 1 Corinthians 12, 9. This, that which is called the change from glory to glory, 2 Corinthians 3, 16. All the glory of who we are in Jesus goes to Jesus. Any amount of boasting is excluded, Romans 3, 27. For it is not of the Father, 1 John 2, 16. Salvation is the gift which is of God without our boasting, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Such faith touches our actions, our emotions, and the power which works by love, Galatians 5, 6. It is the opposition of the sin of unbelief which calls God a liar, 1 John 5, 9, and 10. Lord, help thou my unbelief, Mark 9, 24. I must confess such unbelief to the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12, 2. Lord, when I walk into your church house, how much faith am I taking with me? If you should appear in person, how much faith would I find in your church today? Luke 18, 8. While there is much expression of faith, theologically speaking, there is a need for the availability and possibility of grace through faith. What is the portion of faith in me, in my church? Evidence of lack of faith is indicative of a lack of discipleship training. Before you can train someone to be a disciple, you must first be a disciple yourself. If I, by winning one, then training him to follow Christ through the step-by-step -step program, a separate program would be found in the book Crucified with Christ by Dr. Lyle. This can be ordered from authorhouse.com. Or you can take the course BI 135 from Talented National University. If the salvation of sinners is dependent on our faith for them, what hope have what hope do they have and we will stop there Prevailing Prayer, Lecture 2, Part 3. A question of interest and an ingenious answer. This is a quotation. 
a very interesting question was asked the editor of the Christian Advocate, which has an important bearing on the subject of this lecture, which, with the per pertinent answer given, are as follows. Question. A brother had for 20 years been a Christian, as he firmly believed. He observed the means of grace. He relates several remarkable answers to his prayers occurring during that time that bear a good evidence to the answers of those related by others. Those who knew him believed him to be a Christian man. But one day he was converted and now effectively emphatically affirmed that he had never been a Christian prior to that time, but was deceived and would have lost his soul. What relation did he sustain in Christ? Is it consistent with the Christian truth to believe that God will answer the prayers of others than a righteous man? Was he deceived? those answers being granted in favor of the faithful and fervent prayer of others? Question. Answer. This is a deep question. As helpful as its elucidation, we submit five points. One. If there is no reason to believe that this brother was a hypocrite, he is probably deceived now as to his former religious experience. Anything far more common than many suppose. It is possible for a man to be a Christian and subsequently to come confused in his views and think he was not though not so common as for men to think they are Christians when they are not. Answer two. If he had not clear evidence of conversion, but was consciously living up to the life he had during those 20 years, he had the faith of a servant, as Mr. Wesley puts it, though not that of a son. Answer three, he may have been a Christian for a considerable, considerable period of time and had a brief interval of backsliding before he came to his present light. And now recognizing his backsliding properly, he may have repudiated his first experience unjustly. Answer four, he may have received a very great blessing, so great that having nothing but the memory of his former experience to compare with it, his present state may seem so far above his recollection of that, that he thinks he never was converted. Answer five. God does answer the prayers of the wicked, reverently made in extreme circumstances connected with the promise of obeying him. It is one of the means of leading them to Christ. Nevertheless, the supposed answers to prayers that men attest, running through a long period of wicked lives, are quite as long to be coincidences as real answers. For the scriptures distinctly state that a habit of deliberate wickedness is incompatible with any influence at the throne of grace. But as a man may think he is sick when he is well, or well when he is sick, may recover from an actual sickness and have a mistaken notion as to what really cured him. Or maybe made sick and not know what made him so sick and attribute it to something harmless or even beneficial. In like manner, positive statements about religious experience may or may not be in harmony with the facts. Perhaps if we knew this man, 
we should have no confidence in any of his statements and that without impeaching his general honesty or we might believe he had been a better Christian prior to the time that he says he was converted after the lapse of 20 years than he has been since. Or we might agree fully with all of his statements. Nothing can take the place of protracted experience of the individual case in judging human character and conduct, whether religiously or otherwise. End of that quote. Poem, Perfect Cleansing. Who would be cleansed from every sin must to God's holy altar bring. The whole of life is joy, is tears, is hope, is love, is power, is fears, the will and every cherished thing. Must make this sweeping sacrifice, choose God and dare reproach and shame, and boldly stand in storm or flame for him who paid redemption's price, then trust, not struggle, to believe, and trusting wait for doubt, but pray, and in his on good time he'll say, Thy faith has saved this now received. His time is when the soul brings all, is all upon his altar laying, when pride and self conceit are slain. And crucified with Christ we fall, helpless upon his word we lie. When faithful to his word we feel, the cleansing touch, the Spirit's seal, and know that he does sanctify. By A. T. Alice. The Power of the Name of Christ, Lecture Four. Lord, your direction in our praying is that we are to ask the Father in your name, John 16, 23. For no man may approach the Father without you, John 6, 44. The Father is in the business of supplying, Philippians 4, 13. While our sin may close the door to your 7-Eleven storehouse, the name of Jesus will open its doors. Jesus, your name, gives us the access. Romans 5, 2 and Ephesians 2, 18. Therefore, we can come boldly with confidence. Ephesians 3, 12. What privilege we have to access the portals of glory at the mention of thy name. Yea, what authority when I invoke the name of Jesus. I surrendered all my personal identity in body and spirit and joined the Holy Spirit in prevailing prayer. When I address the King of Kings, I acknowledge his kingdom and authority for the things I believe, Matthew 21, 22. When I have made such a request, I can expect that it will be granted, John 14, 13. Again, by asking the Father in Jesus' name, it will be done, John 15, 16. When I am praying in the Spirit, I can conjoin with the Holy Spirit, and the will of the Lord will be manifest. Quotation. The prevailing, the correction, the privilege of Christ's power of attorney. Many years ago in the city of New York, a merchant failed to a very large amount. After surrendering all his goods to the creditors, he found himself hopelessly bankrupt. No one would give him credit to the amount of a single dollar. He had a brother living in the city of Boston who was everywhere known to be worth millions of dollars. This wealthy brother sent 
unto his bankrupt brother a power of attorney, no limits being designated to conduct business in his name. The poor bankrupt immediately hired a building in the business center of the city, filled it with goods, and commenced operations as one of the most prosperous merchants in the city of New York. In speaking to a friend upon the subject, he said, I will tell you how much I am worth in reality in this city. I am practically just as rich as my brother is. I can purchase anything and live just as well as he can. Yet if I should presume to ask anything in my own name, no man would credit me to the amount of a single dollar. I once in a while, for my own amusement, thus illustrate my position. I enter the store of an importer, and having selected a quantity of goods, request him to send them to my store. But to whom shall I charge them? He replies. To myself, of course, I respond. I cannot do that, is his proper vendor. If your creditors should become aware that you have goods in this state in your store, they would seize them at once and I should lose them forever. I show him my power of attorney and remark that I will purchase the goods in my brother's name. Take what you want is the prompt reply. In that dear name, I could purchase anything the man had. So when and where Christ expressly and specifically authorizes us to ask in his name, he puts us in full possession of a power of eternity by which we may obtain at a throne of grace all that he would were he in our circumstance of need and should he of his own name and behalf ask for the same identical blessings. God cannot deny himself, nor can he deny his son in his own name on be or behalf. Equally, it is impossible for the eternal father to withhold any good thing of which the son has said, ask in my name of the father. That specific blessing the father can no more dishonor the name of Christ, his only begotten son, when and where he has expressly authorized the use of his name that he could cast dishonor upon Christ himself were he personally asking for the same blessing. However, there are express conditions on which Christ has authorized us to ask in his name. We must renounce all sin and abide in him and his word in us. We must walk in faith, nothing wavering. Oh, how much there is in those last two words, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. But let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. That's where we will pause for this round.